Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-host, Emily Zars. What's going on, Emily? Hey, how's it going? Long time no see. I know. it's just. I think the last time I saw you was like yesterday or something like that. Ain't that crazy? You're right. Like 24 hours ago. It's nice to see you again. But, but guess, guess what today is, Emily? Hmm. It's not Taylor and Swift's birthday. It's definitely not Taylor Swift's birthday. What's what it? is today? So today is Chief Chat's 200th episode. We are two. two we, we are two hundred episodes in, and guess what? I brought some special friends to celebrate with me. Yeah, thank you, thank you, production team. <laughs> but I, I brought some special guests uh, in with me today, uh, just to kind of celebrate with us. So uh, let let me introduce you to some of our guests. Can can you pan to just me, uh, production team? <laughs> oh boy! Oh boy! I got I got Shaq in the house. Shaq is here to celebrate. <laughs> Shaq, Shaq is in the house. Uh, hey, Chief, congratulations on 200. <laughs> That's my horrible impression of Shaq. That's your Shaq voice. I got Mark Wahlberg. Not that Mark has hasn't seen me enough all last week, but I I brought him with me to today as well. You did. And we got, you got to present a, a great award to him at the Army Navy. And game. we got the oh. Sergeant Major in the Army. Sergeant Major yes. of the Army, Michael He's A. Grinston. He's here with us today, too. Look at that. So, listen, we got we got athletes. We got uh, uh, movie stars. We got military leaders. Uh, and, and we also got a rock and roll legend that's actually going to celebrate yes. with us today. So, I yeah, mean, I so without further ado. Of, yes, I'm so excited <laughs> for this one. Sorry, Chief. I'm so excited for this one. Now, Emily, well, listen, let me stop blabbering and let's, let's go ahead and introduce today's guest. Yes, I could not think of anyone better for our 200th episode. Um, I'm so excited. And um, this is the kind of music I actually grew up listening to. Um, my mom thought it was very important that we listen to what she described as good music. So I'm so excited for this guest today. Today's guest is best known as the Oats half of Hall and Oats, the most successful duo in music history. Along with his work with Daryl Hall, he has released several solo albums and published a memoir, Changes of Seasons, in 2017. He is a rock and roll Hall of Fame inductee and was this year's international spokesman for the Men's Health Initiative, Movember. Please give a warm chief chat welcome to John Oates! Yay! Yay! Nice to see you guys. Thanks for having me. Oh, yes. absolutely. And, uh, and John, man, this means so much for, to our audience to see you on today. It's a pleasure to meet you. Can you let our viewers know where you're joining us from? Joining you from a log cabin in uh, right outside of Aspen, Colorado in the Rocky Mountains. And uh, it's a great place to be around Christmas time, you know, with all the snow and uh, it feels, feels very Christmassy. <laughs> absolutely. So we're going to jump into, uh, we want to start by hearing about your work with Movember uh, last month. And this is raising awareness for men's health. So how did you become involved with Movember and what did you learn from that experience? Well, um, you know, Chief, as you, as you and I are both uh, brother, brothers of the stash, of the mustache. Oh, oh my goodness. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of was wondering why after all these years they hadn't reached out to me sooner. But um but anyway, you know, I just thought it was a very, very uh, worthwhile cause to uh, to talk about. You know, I uh, men's health is, is is something that's uh, obviously very important to a lot of men, but also something that maybe a lot of men don't like to talk about. And uh, I thought that perhaps if I could um, somehow, you know, uh, be a spokesperson for this and get the word out and and. Uh, you know, perhaps people can see that, you know, someone like me who obviously has been around quite a while and also has had, a, a, you know, a, a lot of success could also be dealing with things that, um, you know, that, that are very important, both emotionally and physically. 
Um, the other thing was, you know, I was very impre- I've always been very impressed with the women's health movement, especially with breast cancer and how well they've communicated their message, you know, through the NFL and uh, various sports events and really uh, made uh, made women's uh, health uh, care uh, a very, very important and very um, visible subject. So I thought that the men's the men's movement could use a little bit of that mojo. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Because, you know, men, we're, we're a little stubborn or we, we got we got a lot of pride and feel like uh, whatever whatever's wrong with us, we just take some rubber t- rubber and put some dirt on it or whatever, the, whatever the remedies that we had kind of growing up. Uh, and and we, we definitely need a spokesman like you to kind of push us in the right direction to go get seen when we need to get seen. Yeah, I mean, you know, men men don't like to go to the doctors. They don't like to talk about it with uh, with their peers, you know. Um, and so, you know, but I think I think things are changing, and I think the younger generation is much more um, much more open about you know, especially about mental health and things. I see it with uh, performers and entertainers and athletes uh, that that are they're talking about this, and it's becoming more uh, accepted, which is a great thing. And speaking of facial hair, your mustache even got a chapter in your memoir, including when you shaved it off around 1990. Um, and there's also at least what we found, at least two Facebook pages about your mustache. Um, and it was also featured in a cartoon. So when did you realize that your mustache had like taken on a life of its own? <laughs> I know, it's kind of crazy. Isn't it? I mean, it's just facial hair, folks. Um, you know, it's one of those things, uh, it became, you know, uh, I had it all through the, the early part of my career, obviously through the 70s and 80s, and it just became a thing. I, I don't know. And I shaved it off when, um, it, you know, around 1990, a lot of things had changed in my life. You know, I'd, I'd gotten divorced. I'd, a manager who I was working with for many years uh, kind of left, and there was a lot of you know, disarray, and uh, everything was kind of disconnected in my life. And for some reason, the mustache kind of represented that guy who uh, who I used to be. And so I shaved it off and I kind of started my life over again. And um, so it was kind of symbolic to me. It meant something to me. It wasn't maybe as, as important to everybody else. But uh, but now, you know, I've kind of grown into my own skin again and um, got no problem with having a little bit up here, a little bit down here. You know, we're good. <laughs> so. Well, as you can tell, I'm I'm a big mustache guy, and um, uh, we, you know, I, including yourself, we had uh, also Tom Selleck on the show, and he's another <laughs> person with a classic mustache. And so I always give it up to all my mustache uh, brothers, brothers in arms, and and actually, uh, I I've only shaved my mustache one time in my life, and that's when I went to a basic training, and so as soon as I got out of basic training, because I. I look like a totally different person without a mustache. So I just, I, I, I look like Willis from different strokes is what people have told me. So I was like, nah, I don't want, I don't want to look like Willis from different strokes. So let, let me, uh, let me keep this mustache. You know, and, uh, I, I've been yeah, rocking I feel, it for the past. I, I think some, I think some men were just born to have a mustache man. you know? <laughs> no, absolutely. Absolutely. So bes- besides your Movember work, uh, you're also busy touring Europe in November. So can you give us the highlights of that, that tour? Yeah, I just came back from uh, three weeks in Europe. It was fantastic. I hadn't been there because of COVID been there in about three years. Um, and I was curious to see what, 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 what was going on in Europe and how, you know, how things were feeling. It would felt pretty good um, considering, you know, the war in Ukraine and all the things that are going on with COVID. But um, it was great. I toured um, with an amazing artist named Beth Hart. Uh, who's a friend and incredible singer and performer. Uh, we did a, a number of shows in Germany. We did Zurich. We did uh, Brussels, Belgium, and Amsterdam. And working on uh, going back to Europe again in the spring and perhaps the summer. Uh, I'm doing now an acoustic show. I'm doing kind of a show that um, is more like a singer-songwriter show where I tell stories about how the songs are written and the experience of, of collaborating and writing on writing songs. Uh, so it's a completely different style than what I would do with Daryl. Um, and it's much more, uh, like I said, it's an acoustic show, much more intimate. And you released a single, Pushing a Rock, in late October. And how has that song evolved since you recorded it in 2014? 
Um, you've done your homework, haven't you? That's great. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm so no, excited I, when you're here, John. <laughs> no, I, I, I appreciate it. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, the song was originally, uh, I wrote it with Nathan Paul Chapman, who um, was uh, Taylor's original producer. In fact, he did uh, a lot of um, his early demo before she even became, you know, had a record contract. So um, at the time, she had moved on to other producers. And I just, I just, you know, he, since he was one of the first people I met in Nashville, I called him up and I just asked him how he was doing just to kind of check, check out, check in with him. And, you know, he said, this is a, you know, I don't know where my creative career is going to go now. Was tied up and, and you know, wrapped up in Taylor's uh, creative life. So um, it was kind of interesting. And, and I said, well, you know, we all have challenges. We all have things that we have to overcome. And uh, I thought, yeah, that's an interesting idea for a song. And so I went over to his house and we recorded a version of this song, which I, I did record on an album in 2014, as you said. Uh, but I was never really happy with it 100%. I always thought that the lyrics were really powerful, but I didn't think I, I did a very good job with the music, honestly. Um, and then when COVID hit and I was sitting at home, uh, I revisited the song and I, I felt that it needed a refresh. It needed a, a you know, kind of a, a reimagination. And I basically kept almost, in fact, all the words, all the lyrics were almost the same as the original, but I rewrote all the music. And I thought it was much more contemporary, much more in line with the way I was feeling right now and really happy with it. And then we did, an, we did a video in Nashville. Um, and if you've seen the video, you know, it's really all about, uh, it's about hopefully about showing people that they can, um, you know, try to overcome whatever challenges they might have. And, and uh, it really kind of, it, it kind of was in, in sync with the Movember um, Jing about mental health and, you know, uh, and basically just that stay strong and you can overcome uh, anything that comes your way. Yeah. And I think it also um, coming out around COVID where everyone was having a really hard time too, because um, no one knew what to expect. So I thought it was a great time for a refresh. Um, as well, because I think like me and everyone else, music is where a lot of people land on um, when they're going through stuff. So um, kudos to you, John. Perfect timing for a refresh on that. And um, it did. So it's like, it's all right. Yes. And I loved it. I loved it in 2014 and I loved it now. Um, but the music video was great as well. And um, so your songwriting process, um, what was it like with Daryl Hall and how did it prepare you for your solo work? which is different from your work with Daryl. You know, uh, it was interesting. I, you know, obviously throughout my early, the whole early part of my career, the only one I really collaborated with was Daryl Hall. Um, you know, we worked together constantly for, you know, 20 years. Um, and so, you know, I, I did a few little things with other people during that period of time. But, you know, it was basically Hall & Oates was the focus of everything. Um, when I went to Nashville, moved to Nashville in the early, you know, early 2000s, um, it was interesting to collaborate with new people, and it was interesting to see how the creative process would unfold. And what, what, I, what I was kind of pleasantly surprised about was that it was almost identical to the way I worked with Daryl. I, I, I found that other songwriters seemed to approach the art and craft of songwriting in a very similar manner. Um, it was, uh, you know, everyone's different because each person's personality is different. Everyone has a different agenda, things like that. But, uh, but basically, by and large, it was pretty much the same. Um, it really, uh, I think songwriters have a sensitivity to the outside world, to the world around them, uh, to the emotional impact of, of uh, their personal relationships, to, uh, to, to everything from that, to the things they read about in, in a newspaper or see on television or uh, might want to somehow reflect. And um, so songwriters, I think, really kind of approach it the same way. So to answer your question in a very simple way, it wasn't much different. Gotcha. And, and like I said, we could talk about Hall of Notes songs all day, uh, but we would like to hear the story behind uh, She's Gone and especially about his video. Mm -hmm. So which you wrote about in your memoir as well. So, and people can also view this uh, video on YouTube, but if you can give us a little insight on She's Gone, that'd be awesome. <laughs> well, the video, I don't even know where to start with the video. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's, start, let's start with the song and then we'll work our way to the video. Um, okay. the, the song had an interesting, uh, interesting uh, inspiration. Uh, I was in New York City, it was December of 1972. 
And I had gone down downtown to the to Greenwich Village, and I went to see a show somewhere. It was the middle of the night. And I went into a, a soul food restaurant that was one of the few places in the Greenwich Village, believe it or not, that was open all night. And this gal came in, and she was kind of wacky and you know, crazy. And she had a, you know, cowboy boots and a tutu and it was freezing cold out. And, you know, so anyway, we, we kind of hit it off. Um, I asked her if she wanted to get together on New Year's Eve and she said, yes, but on New Year's Eve, she never showed up. So there I was sitting in my apartment with a little acoustic guitar and I thought, well, if she's not coming tonight, then she's gone. And I thought, hmm, hmm. And I started plunking around on the guitar and I came up with this very folky kind of thing that um, was basically the chorus of She's Gone. Uh, and then a few days later, uh, Daryl and I got together and I played it for him and he liked it. He sat at the piano and came up with this groove that was much different from what I had done on the acoustic guitar, much more, um, much more in an R&B style and the signature piano part that you hear in the beginning of the song. And uh, that's how the song evolved. And he and I both wrote that song in probably an hour and a half. Uh, we just looked around us and we just captured, uh, you know, images of loss and loneliness. And uh, that's, that's what happened. When we made the record, that's where the magic was in that song. Because we made the record at Atlantic Studios, the, uh, the same studios where Aretha Franklin and Wilson Pickett and, you know, so many uh, Ray Charles had recorded. So it had this magic in the recording studio. And we were also working with the great Arif Martin, one of the world's greatest producers. And he really took that song and made it blossom. So that's, um, you know, that's, that's what happened with the song. In terms of the video, that's a long story. Um, we, <laughs> If anyone who hasn't seen this video, I highly recommend seeing this video because, and keep in mind, this was made over 10 years before MTV. So there was no such thing as MTV. People were not making videos. So it, it's kind of, in, you know, in a way breaking. I don't think, I don't think Daryl and I have gotten enough credit over the years for doing things like that or, that have really been, uh, you know, groundbreaking in terms of that. But anyway, uh, we were asked to uh, go to a teenage uh, television show at Atlantic City, New Jersey, and they wanted us to lip sync the song while the kids danced. And we thought, we can't lip sync the song and teenage kids dancing. I mean, we thought it was weird. So we said, why don't we just go and we'll record a, vi a version of it for you, and then you can just show the version. Little did they know that we were going to show up with our furniture from our apartment. Um, the girl in the, in the diaphanous dress who walks through the video, that's Sarah, who Daryl later on wrote Sarah Smile about. Um, the, the guy in the devil's costume was our road manager, Randy, who is now the, ro who's now the manager for John Mellencamp. Um, and we, we, we dressed up and I mean, you can see Daryl's got a black bathrobe on. I, I rented a penguin suit. Um, if you need to know why, just remember it was 1972 and that's all I'll say. Um, <laughs> and, uh, we have monopoly money, which we threw up in the air. And so the weird thing was we went to this TV sh uh, station in Philadelphia and they were really pissed off. They thought we were mocking them. And I guess we were in a way, but not really. Um, but they, and they didn't want to show the video. They wouldn't show the video. And in fact, um, they called Atlantic Records and they said, who do these guys think they are? You know, they're, they're making a joke of our TV show. Um, we, you know, they'll never get played on radio again in Philadelphia, you know, and on and on. It created this big, big brouhaha. Uh, and interesting enough now, I mean, it's my favorite video that we've ever done. And anyone who hasn't seen it here again, I highly recommend checking it out. Yes, go and check out the video. If, and yes, I, the the penguin in the night, a penguin suit in 1972. I could just, you know, there's a whole bunch of things you can imagine going on with that. So uh, that's all. <laughs> yeah. Use your imagination. Yes, use your imagination. We can leave it right there. <laughs> So you've worked with a lot of artists uh, besides Daryl. Uh, what do you enjoy about collaboration and, and who's on your collaboration bucket list? Well, I've had the good fortune of collaborating with so many amazing people. Um, uh, you know, I got a chance back in the in the uh, early 90s, I, I collaborated with a guy named Iva Davies who had a group called Ice House. And he invited me to Australia and we wrote a song called Electric Blue, which became a, a really big hit, one of the biggest hits in Australia and also was a big hit here in America. Um, I've had a chance to collaborate with Vince Gill, uh, Ryan Tedder from One Republic, um, 
a guy named Jim Lauderdale, who's an Americana artist, one of my favorite uh, artists, uh, and so on and so forth. Just so many people. Um, it's just a, it's an interesting thing, collaboration with, uh, it, it's almost like a psych, like a, you have to kind of figure out, well, what is it that this, this other person that you're working with might want, or what do they want from you, or what can you offer them? Um, and your role changes depending on who you're working with. Sometimes you become an editor. Sometimes you become a sounding board for their ideas, or sometimes they rely on you to give to throw out some ideas that they can uh, work off of. So every situation is slightly different uh, in terms of that, but but the actual mechanics of doing it once you do get get on a roll and and get an idea going, then it becomes very similar. Uh, you just exchange ideas, you bat things back and forth. I think the main thing to remember in collaboration is never to be embarrassed of throwing out a really wacky or something crazy because it might not be the, the, the perfect thing, but it might hire the other person to, to think of something. So it's, it's, and it's also a thing of trust. If you don't feel comfortable throwing out your ideas, uh, it kind of stymies the, the whole process. So is there any, any newer artists that you would, would love to collab with or? Um, most of the artists I'd love to collaborate with are dead. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I never got a chance to write with Curtis Mayfield, uh, Doc Watson. I mean, I'm 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 old school, man. I I, I love yeah. the classic, you know, some of the innovators, you know, people like Chuck Berry, and I go back and I think about the early days of rock and roll, and even before rock and roll, the music that preceded rock and roll. I'm very very interested in the music from the 1930s. I know that's like a like you know, an, <laughs> a niche subject so to speak, but um, people don't realize how important. The, uh, the development of radio and the phonograph machine were. You know, you have to think back to the early days of, of popular music. People could not hear music unless you heard someone play it live. And all of a sudden there was a radio. All of a sudden there was a phonograph machine. You could hear music in your home. That was groundbreaking. It was probably as groundbreaking as the internet is today. Um, and uh, people don't realize there were million selling records that happened in 1920. Um, and it led to uh, really the evolution of rock and roll in the early 1950s. So um, I, I'm very, I'm kind of a music historian. I like to, to you know, kind of go back because after all, it's what I've done my whole life. So I wanted to know where it all started. Well, well, actually, and you probably had the the ultimate collaboration uh, in, in history because for those that don't know, you were in the We Are the World. Uh, uh, yeah, a song and video and uh, like you had like your you had everybody on We Are the World. And I remember it as a kid vividly, uh, you know, just seeing all my favorite artists in one central location. It was uh, it, it was cool to see that. Well, I had I'll tell you, when I was standing in that group uh, during the group part of the, the vocals, um, I had Ray Charles right to my lower left. I could literally put my hand on his shoulder. And then I had Bob Dylan right behind me on my upper right. Um, and I'm thinking while, while I was singing and while this was all happening, I was looking around. I like to, you know, when moments like this are happening, you know, you don't want to let them go by without being appreciative of, of what's happening. And I thought, wow, here's two legendary artists who are some of my favorites. And here I am standing right in between them. Um, and I just, um, I just have to be very appreciative and very, very, uh, you know, uh, very, very aware that this moment may never happen again. In fact, it will, it will never happen again. So it's pretty special. And um, I like to try to keep, uh, you know, not take things like that for granted. Yeah, I saw that you got everybody to autograph the, the, the music sheet uh, yeah. for that song as well. Yeah, yeah the only pe person I know who did it was Kenny, La uh, Kenny Rogers. And he, uh, it was just sold recently at an auction. Um, and I believe I'm the only other one that has it. I have every person that was in that room signed the uh, manuscript, the musical uh, sh lead sheet, what we call lead sheet. Uh, and I have it framed. Uh, so um, it's one of my prized possessions. And uh, yeah, it's pretty special. That's incredible. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh my mm -hmm. gosh. Uh, no, I love that. And um, I, I'm like picturing, I don't know how I would feel if I'm standing between Ray Charles and Bob Dylan. That is, a, that's an amazing memory to have. Um, and 
What are some songs or albums that you've done both solo and with Daryl Hall um, that you wish more people would discover? Well, uh, you know, I think with Daryl, we've, we, we've had a lot of people have discovered our music. I don't think we have a problem. I know. There. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, I mean, I can just name a few of the Hall & Oates albums that I think are the kind of the, you know, the kind of landmark albums. I, it would start with Abandoned Luncheonette in 1973, uh, because that was the album that kind of put us on the map. Um, then I would say in 1980, when we did the Voices album, that was the first album where we produced ourselves. And that changed everything and really kind of opened the door to our great success that we had in the 80s, because we finally were making the records that we wanted to make in the way we wanted to make them. Um, and then I think uh, another album that's very important is the Big Bamboom album in around 85, because it was the it was kind of the height of analog recording that was never going to get any better. Uh, and digital recording was in its infancy. It just started. And we were combining this new digital technology with the analog technology, which was already well developed. Um, and so we were experimenting and doing all kinds of unusual things. So that record was really a groundbreaking record. So um, in terms of the Hall & Oates records, I think those those three records really kind of, they're, they, they're kind of landmark records for us. Um, I'm very proud of an album I made in, eight, in 2018 called Arkansas, which I kind of goes back to what I was talking about, the early days of American popular music, where I, I did a lot of research and I went back and recorded some of these songs that were million selling songs back in the 1920s and 30s, uh, and then even the 1940s. So um, I thought it was kind of a, a good way for people to realize that American popular music didn't start with rock and roll. And uh, I talk about that a lot in my acoustic shows, and I kind of go take it, take people, you know, on a, on a little musical time trip, uh, I guess you'd say, um, through some of that stuff uh, without, you know, without trying to sound like a boring uh, college professor. Um, try to make it entertaining. Absolutely. So, Chief Chef, viewers, go out there and, and find, uh, check out Arkansas if y'all haven't uh, seen it already or, or checked it out already. Uh, we'd like to hear about some of your passions besides music. Um, including you got, I heard you got an awesome car collection and, and also you, you've been a, a private plane, private pilot at some point in your life as well. Yeah, I, I, I raced cars. I have a car collection. I, I was a pilot. Um, I guess, I guess once you're a pilot, you're always a pilot, but I'm definitely yeah, not current and I'm not flying anymore. Um, yeah, I, um, I've been a bit of a thrill seeker. I'm downhill skiing, uh, telemark skiing. Uh, in fact, when this interview's over, I'm strapping on my skis and I'm going, doing some cross country skiing. Uh, so um, I love bike. I love mountain biking, road biking. I love hiking in the, in the mountains. Um, I, I try to stay active. I do a lot of yoga. Um, I eat too much chocolate. That's on the downside, I guess. Um, <laughs> That's not a bad but thing. But yeah, I do. Yeah, no well, <laughs> well, over the holidays, it can be. It can be. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, I do have a car collection. I like uh, I like sports cars, small small sports cars, which I've always enjoyed and. The roads around Nashville, Tennessee are incredible. Uh, these great country roads and nothing better than going out in early morning and no radio, just the sound of the motor and driving on these country roads and just letting my mind wander and uh, enjoying that experience. That's awesome. And um, John Oates, you're just so cool. <laughs> I just want to say that, like <laughs> rock and roll. And then and also you race cars, you fly planes, you're going to go ski, cross country skiing later. Um, you're just so cool. They just don't make them like they used to, is what I. They, I don't, make, they don't make them like <laughs> they used to. So, with our wow. generation, <laughs> they don't. Okay, okay. So Emily just compared me with a Model T Ford, which is okay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but um since we have a military audience watching live with us today um please we know that so we know that your father served in the navy um would you mind just kind of sharing um that about your father who served in the navy during world war ii yes um my father is 99 uh he'll be 100 this, this coming july and he's amazing uh, i can't tell wow. you this guy's uh, I don't think he's ever going anywhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, he was a he was in the Fighting Seabees, and which was the naval construction outfit. Uh, and he was stationed um, he was stationed in the, in the uh, Aleutian Islands, which is the string of islands that comes down into the Pacific from Alaska. 
and they built air airfields and uh, did various things like that. He was also in some of the Pacific Islands as well, building airfields. Uh, and he's got some great stories. And you know, a few years ago, um, we, our family did a, our son lives in Washington, D.C. And uh, we wanted to bring him down to the World War II Memorial, which he had never seen. And it was an amazingly powerful moment. Uh, we brought him down there and uh, there was a lot of tourists, you know, people wandering around the memorial. And we bought him a hat, you know, World War II veterans cap, and he wore it. And uh, it was really amazing because one at one moment without, you know, we were just walking around looking at, at the memorial and he just stopped and he saluted. And it, it was amazing. And then all these young kids came up to him and they were congratulating him and everything. It was very moving and he, he was really emotionally moved. Um, and you know, when they say the greatest generation, it's really, it's the truth. It was, um, it, the world changed and they, they changed it and it was very, very powerful. I love that. Thank you so much for um, sharing that about your father with us. Um, and love that he's going to hit the 100. I'd love to hear that. 100 years. That's amazing. Yep. Um, yeah, he's going to That's awesome. And I love that. That's wonderful. And um, like I said, we have a lot of viewers watching live. So I'm going to turn really quickly um, to our Facebook live chat um, and answer, uh, ask you just a couple of questions um, that we have in the have in the chat. So one came from, get my handy dandy phone. We have a lot of love in the chat. Everyone's happy you're here. Julie was asking, how do you handle being part of extremely famous and successful duo to stand on your own? Artist? Well, uh, you know, the thing about Daryl and I, have, we've always looked at ourselves as two individuals who work together. We don't necessarily see ourselves as this, uh, kind of inseparable duo we we really don't actually we don't like that um we actually like the idea that we're two separate people and uh so it's very it's very comfortable for me and it's comfortable for him you know he does his own thing he's got his own creative projects that he likes to do uh, i've got the things i like to do and then we get together and we play together so it's the best of all worlds i love that and chris is asking um, who has been your mentors in the music industry and how did they help your career? Well, I've had a, I've had a, a lot. Um, one of the, my guitar instructor teacher back in the 1960s was a guy named Jerry Ricks, who um, was very involved in the blues and folk revival that was happening in the in the 1960s in America, where a lot of traditional musicians were were being rediscovered and playing the folk festivals and things like that. Um, and I, um, I I met him and I took lessons from him. We became friends. He actually played on um, on Daryl and I's uh, first and second albums, and uh, he introduced me to people like Doc Watson and Mississippi John Hurt. Uh, people who were affected and, and influenced me as a guitar player. So I got a chance to study and learn from the originators, from the guys who, are, you know, really created this uh, amazing traditional American music. He was one. Um, the other one would be Arif Martin, who I had mentioned, who was our producer on She's Gone and the Abandoned Luncheonette album, one of the world's greatest producers. Uh, you know, he passed away a number of years ago, but... He was highly influential on on me. Uh, I learned so much about how to make a, a record, how to record in the in the studio, how to get the, the best out of the musicians and the players that you're involved with. Uh, he was very, very important. And, uh, you know, uh, my other inspirations have come really from my family, from my wife and my son and uh, my good friends and the musicians that I've met in Nashville who are so inspiring because of their incredible skill level. Um, when I first came to Nashville, I was... I was blown away by the how good everyone was. Uh, it's it's an incredible uh, incredible place, and uh, I actually started uh, practicing more when I went to Nashville because I realized that the level of musicianship was on a, a very high level. So um, I've had tons of mentors along the way. Awesome, thank you so much. And I did want to just say there is a consensus in the chat. Everyone says your mustache is iconic and to keep it never shave it everyone loves it that is just the the big one in the chat everyone okay. loves All right. the mustache. <laughs> okay i i i um i acquiesce to the whims of the people <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm gonna have to look. I'm gonna have to look that word up because I'm. I'm not sure. You know, I'm from Louisiana. I, we, we, that's too many syllables for me. <laughs> I chief. I'm sorry, man. I was a journalism major too, so you know. Um, so, sorry about that. I have to. I have to. Hey, don't forget. You know, I have to throw. I have to throw out these. Uh, these. Uh, you know, th uh, multiple syllable words every once in a while, so people know that. You know, I'm not just a guitar player. <laughs> right. Yes. You know. You know yeah. big words. <laughs> I did well, just they, want to. They just hired me for my good looks, anyway. They... <laughs> I, I did just want to share um, really quickly how I came to know you, John Oates, in um, Hall and Oates. I was on a road trip with my family, and we were in the middle of nowhere, and there was only one radio station that worked, and um, Man Eater came on. And um, me and my sister were like, oh, yeah, this is good, Bob. And like, we loved it. And then it ended and then it came on again and then it ended and then it came on again. And then we realized this radio station was playing man eater over and over and over and over again. <laughs> and I was like, I need to know more about this, this band, this Hall and Oates. And um, that's how I that's became crazy. a fan is because man eater is like embedded in my brain forever since the early nineties. <laughs> no. um, yeah. You know, Hey, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick story about man eater. Um, when I came up with the idea for the chorus of that, I wrote it as a reggae song. And then when Daryl and I collaborated on it, we changed the groove and the style to the record that you are that you know. Um, however, this past April, I went down to Kingston, Jamaica, and I re-recorded it in a reggae version, which I'm going to release oh, wow. this spring. Uh, and no I recorded way. with some of the, wow. Yeah, I recorded with some of the legends of reggae, the guys who played with Bob Marley, Toots and the Maytals, uh, Peter Tosh, and we did a, a totally reggae version in Kingston, Jamaica. It was an amazing experience. And so I'll release that, uh, I think, in June, May or June. Oh, my gosh. Well, fingers crossed it gets stuck on the radio and just goes over and over and over and over again. <laughs> it'll, it'll, be, it'll be out there. It'll be out there. Yeah. That's yeah, awesome. man, that's, that's, that sounds like a Christmas story uh, on TBS. <laughs> <laughs> That, that forever loop, but but I want to. Uh, I got Richie Whitmer on my page that said he loved the music and loved the house. Um, so the, the cabin, the cabin is a big hit as well. And I would That's be good. remiss if I, yeah, and I would be remiss if I didn't tell you uh, about my mother in law. My mother in law is an absolute. She loves uh, Hall and Oates. She loved the music that you all produced. And uh, so big shout out to Devora Williams out there in Louisiana. Uh, I, I I don't think she knows that I'm gonna. Uh, you know, call her out, but uh, I had to let her know because uh, they, they let me know as soon as uh, they found out I was interviewing you. There was like uh, that that a whole bunch of records were on repeat uh, in in the house. So you, so Emily, you may have tapped into my mother in law's house. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the radio, I don't know for some reason, six got crossed and it went through a radio station. So it's probably her house playing Man Eater over and over again. No, it was the fun, and that's just a memory we'll always have because we were like, oh, again, again, and that was like in the '90s. But like, it's something we'll always remember. It was just really cool, and it was it. really important to my mom that we listened to all of that. And um, I remember I was reluctant, but my mom was like, no, you need to go see Ray Charles. You need to see Hollow Notes. You've got to see oh, you know um, Bob Dylan. I just saw Bob Dylan this year. He doesn't allow cell phones, which I thought was really cool all about the music like i love that so yeah uh, well, you know what i'm i'm really glad you know shout out to your mom because i love that <laughs> i love i love when parents you know uh kind of give uh give their kids uh, you know solid inspiration and um kind of give them a great background on 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 uh on what they consider to be good music so that's cool yeah <laughs> absolutely and, and I see you're pretty active online and in, on social media. So um, where can we find out more about your work and your causes? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm everywhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> Instagram at John Oates official um, at John Oates on Twitter uh, at John Oates music, Facebook, and um, I'm on TikTok too. So uh, believe okay. it or not, and I've got a, you know, between my wife and, and uh, uh, a great social media gal who helps me out. Um, they're constantly making me do silly things for TikTok, and um, so I'm jumping around. And I think we just—I think we just put out something with me playing air guitar in front of a giant gorilla. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's out there somewhere. I mean, so yeah, so so we we're, we have fun with it. We have fun with it. 
Absolutely. And and for our Chief Chat viewers, uh, you can find this episode as well as past Chief Chat episodes on YouTube and Spotify. So please tune in on 11 a.m. December 20th when we have our guest will be Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Brian Slade, an Afghan war veteran and author of Cleared Hot. And that will be our last episode for 2022. So please tune in for that. Uh, but John, man, it like Emily said, you're probably the, the cool the coolest guest that we've had ever out of 200 oh, episodes because you because you, you just kind of sit oh, back on, on the chief. couch. Come on, chief. chief, you say that to all the guests. I know, I know. <laughs> well, yeah, come on. You, you know what? You know, John, he, John's a vet, man. He he knows that Hollywood talk all the time, man. My goodness, I can't I can't get anything past you. <laughs> but man, but but thank you so much for for just blessing the world with your, your gift of music and and like Emily said, it, uh, music is an outlet for a lot of us and 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 you all put out some timeless music that's gonna last from generation to generation. Uh, I'm sure uh, Emily, once she has kids, she's gonna be playing Man Eater or I can't go for that whenever they want some <laughs> Christmas <laughs> gifts or or whatever the case may be. Just strategically putting that those awesome songs uh, in, in people's lives. So thank you so much for sharing your gift with the world. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And um, just uh, y'all be doing some acoustic shows around the country. So if anyone wants to uh, check out the other side of uh, my music and uh, kind of uh, experience that thing. Um, in fact, I, uh, I should plug a show on January 19th at, in St. Petersburg, Florida at the Let's Mahaffey Theater, which I'm doing with a, my good buddy Guthrie Trapp. He's an amazing uh, guitar player from Nashville. So uh, and we'll be doing lots of other shows around. So um, look forward to um, to seeing everybody. And you're gonna post post the dates on your uh, social media? Oh yeah, they'll, they'll yeah. all be posted. We're we're playing uh, Aspen, Colorado on March 10th, and we're playing uh, Telluride, Colorado on February 24th. So uh, yeah, just I'm just having fun with it, playing these really cool old theaters, uh, great places to hear acoustic music, um, and uh, just enjoy enjoying uh, trying to enjoy the mountains. That's awesome! Awesome. So, John, if you don't mind hanging on uh, till after the live so we can kind of say our formal goodbyes. But uh, on sure, I, I want to tell you in front of our audience, just thank you so much uh, for spending time with us. And we had a great interview. Like we could literally sit here and talk to you all day because uh, uh, like l legit. And I, and I don't say that to every guest. So <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't. I promise. <laughs> all, right. Okay. all right. OK. Absolutely. Yo, it's been a so, pleasure. Uh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Awesome. So just hang on tight. Um, but we'll end the show right here and uh, chief chat out.